Let me introduce you to my Warco drill press. But could it be improved? Welcome back to the workshop. So let's dive straight in and we'll talk a little bit about chucks or more specifically run out. So I've just been doing some tests here with this brand new keyless chuck and looking at the run out at the bottom of this precision ground bar and at the top and we'll show you those numbers in a minute. First of all I'll show you the previous chuck I had on there. So that as you can see this is a little bit of footage I took a while back this is the run out with the uh, the old chuck or the chuck I've been running with this drill for quite a while and it was something like at the bottom of that bar it was 0.47 millimeters yes that's 0.47 run out at the bottom and then towards the top of the jaws it was 0.2 so not great and this is the chuck that I've been using with this drill press for quite a few years now it's it's drilled lots of stuff up to and including everything up to this kind of stuff in aluminium mostly so it's had a fairly hard life but I think basically what's happened is I don't know if we can get you in there really bright enough but uh, the edges of each of those jaws have got quite bright no I can't probably get you in there so they've got some pretty bright wear marks along there and um, yeah as you can see I've never really done too much to it never cleaned it or anything so some pretty big run out on that. Yeah, I guess I could uh, clean it out and just see if I can get that a bit better. But I guess it's potentially worn a bit on the jaws. Okay, so getting back to this, this is my keyless chuck. This is a brand new keyless chuck. I've never used it. I've had it probably at least a year and the idea was to use it on this project. Um, so you just twist these two milled parts to uh, tighten the bits in there. You don't need a key. It goes from 3 to 16 millimeters. It's got a B16 taper, which is that bit there. And then I've mounted it on this arbor that's got B16 on one end and Morse taper 2 into the top of the spindle there. Um, and I've been measuring some numbers at the bottom of this precision bar and at the top, and I'll show you those now. Okay, so have a look at some of those numbers in the table here. So I actually measured the run out in the spindle. So if you take the chuck off the arbor, you're left with the Morse taper 2 spindle, put the DTI up in there, and got just under 0.02, which is a little high. It'd be better if it was virtually zero on a uh, on a hundredth millimeter DTI, but that's what it is. Uh, then if you put an arbor in there, that's the Morse taper 2 adapter to the BT16, which is what you need to get to the back of this these particular chucks. Um, that was pretty good because that held that number, so 0.02. So that's the best it's ever going to be with any chuck using an arbor on this particular drill press. Uh, as you've just seen, the current chuck, the pretty old worn out one. It's had a lot of life. Um, it was 0.2 millimeters near the jaw, that's 0.2, not 0.02, and nearly half a millimeter when you're at the base of that bar, and that bar is probably about 50 millimeters long away from the chuck. So not good, it's had a lot of life in it, and um, it's pretty worn. Uh, the new keyless one, which I just showed you, uh, I've just measured, I've not drilled anything with that, but just measured 0.05 near the jaws and 0.14 near the base of the bar down here. That's a lot better. When you feel the jaws though, I just get this sense that they're probably not going to last that long. It just, I mean, it's 25 pounds, so, you know, not not that expensive. And I just wonder how long that's going to last or if it's going to walk back to these kind of values within a year or so. Uh, had a look online and there's a company called Rotogrip who specialise in chucks and emailed the guy there and he said, uh, yeah, the Jacobs ones they've got in, it was in, the run out was given in inches, but it's equivalent to uh, 0.1 millimetres, which looking at these two values is maybe on the high side but it depends how they tested it I don't know if it's if they've got a test bar and they're sticking it out somewhere in the middle also given the reputation of those chucks I suspect it's a lot harder and it will hold that number a lot longer and it won't wear out quite as quick as certainly this first one did here so I've got point one on the Jacobs and then he said about the best you can have or the most premium quality is these Albrecht ones um, and they quoted at 0.07 and that's probably about as good as it's going to get with a chuck 
Okay, also had a little look around just at nominal values for collets, which are supposed to be very low run out, and depend on the, spec uh, the, the, the brand, if you like, 0.01 to 0.03. It was typically what was quoted for collets. So where does that leave us? Well, the the Jacobs chuck was about sixty pounds. Uh, so put it into perspective, uh, the current chuck that was that came with the drill press. I don't know how much that was. The new keyless one I bought. And that's the one you got here. It was about twenty five, and that's what you got there. Twenty five pounds. Jacobs was coming in about sixty pounds. Uh, the Albrecht was I don't know if it was a hundred, hundred and twenty, something like that depend on the exact uh, feature content on it and uh, which sizes it went to so so pretty expensive to get you a little bit extra although I'm sure it'd be nice to use and it'll be very hard wearing it'll last a long time and then the alternatives these collet ones down here which are very accurate now I've ordered because um, I've always sort of fancied one anyway I've ordered a Morse taper 2 to collet uh, chuck and I've got a collet set of 32 m30 uh, er32 collets from somewhere around two or three millimeters all the way up to about 20 millimeters so I can make use of that um, of course it's much slower to change collets over but if for some reason I want really accurate drilling uh, an end mill whatever um, or if for some reason I need to pick up off an edge just one particular edge then a, a collet is a possibility so I've ordered that it wasn't that expensive uh, so we'll have a look at that when it arrives and see what that runouts like um, yeah so I'm a bit undecided on which way to go uh, what I'll probably do is run this new keyless chuck for a while uh, while I'm figuring out which way I want to go. If you're picking up off an edge, which is what I want to do, uh, and then I can get it in the exact right uh, point to drill holes using the digital readout, I can pick up off an edge using the edge finder, but because I'll pick up off one edge and then the other, if there's a bit of run out, um, I think in theory, the way I'm thinking about it, it should still find the center. So um, maybe we'll run with this for a bit and then just see where that takes us. So where does that leave us? Well, obviously I've got digital readout, so if I'm picking up off an edge with an edge finder and then pick up off the other edge and then center, I think even with a small amount of run out, it should cancel, I think, and uh, it'll take me to the center. So that's not such a big deal. Once I've got to the position of the first hole, I can use the DRO and the, the readouts to, to move to any other hole positions. So the centers will all be pretty correct. Um, just that any run out on the drill itself will tend to want to make an oversized hole. Now of course it depends on the flexibility of the drill bit and how long it is as to whether it ends up making um, an oversized hole and in most cases it won't be super critical. So I think for now I'll probably stick with this, see how we get on, but if you've got any experiences of other chucks, maybe some of these or some other ones and you've got some run out numbers, um, yeah put it in the comments, it'd be good to hear from you and uh, I'll have a look at it. Okay now we're pretty happy with the alignment of the table and the alignment of this with the quill. Uh, what we need to do, we'll just put these little um, five millimeter grub screws in either side. So basically those are kind of like jacking screws and those push against this box section. And the idea was I could use those to level it, but because it's pretty good as it is, I guess this is because it's a ground plate and I haven't overly tightened these. So it's kind of sitting in its natural plane. We'll just put those locking screws in there because I'll show you in a minute down the side. There is daylight in a few places um, because obviously the box section is not flat. Um, so that means that these, these screws that are holding this plate on are not super tight. Uh, so I just want to make get that torqued up. So we've got our M5 grub screws, which are just going to lock the whole system in place with. Uh, we've got some Loctite here, and then we've got a DTI from here to here. And basically I just want to make it so that when I put the grub screws in, make sure this doesn't move. In other words, I'm not uh, moving the railway. In fact, that isn't going to work, is it? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm measuring on the same back in a minute. So now you can see I've got the DTI magnetic base onto the steel box section there and then the little arms comes forward onto this box section that's clamped onto this. So as I do up one of the screws, so I can just about see one there, there's the M5 screw. It'll push through this plate and start to bear against this box section. If I overdo it, it'll start to push the rail away and then I should see a reading on here. So I want to tighten it up, lock it in place and get some torque onto the, the screws that are already in there and then know it's all locked in place and it should stay there. Uh, throughout its life hopefully. Okay let me just show you the the gap we've got between the box section and the reason why we need this jacking system just to get it into position. Right, let's see if I can actually show you the gap. This might not be so easy. No I don't think this is going to work. 
it's not much it's it's pretty small uh, you might be able to see down there let's try oh there we go so there is a slight gap there so what we want to do is get the grub screw in there bearing against that to, to put some tension on the, the screw that's behind this rail you can't see that holds this onto there and put some uh, tension and some put some torque on the bolt basically but holds that in position so it's just really more towards the, the bottom there and that's because this is a ground flat plate and then this is just a box section steel so it's not super flat it's not too bad as you go higher don't know if we can see any in fact up there No, not so much up there and towards the top, I think it's okay as well. And maybe a little bit just there. Too slight. But anyway, that's, um, that's what we need to do. We need to get each of those little jacking screws in there, either side, bear it against that section. You can see on that side as well. Here we go, all the way down there and then that should hold it in position. I've moved everything round a little bit because I couldn't get in, film it and put the, uh, actually get the screw in and get the allen key in there as well. So it's basically the same setup. We're just measuring and make sure when we tighten this up we don't get any movement there or if we do we know we're at the limit. Now we're going to um, lock that in place with some Loctite which is this stuff here and oh, hang on, yeah. So Years ago, I bought this off eBay and it actually said Loctite, the proper brand, all the right colours, Loctite. I was sent this, which is almost the same, but not quite, quite sneaky. Uh, it's got lots of uh, Chinese characters on it, so I guess, yeah, it's a kind of copy product. So, and I paid the normal price for the Loctite stuff as well. So, you know, I was expecting the genuine product. So I complained to the seller, they gave me my money back. I've been using it ever since and it's okay. It just feels a bit watered down. I don't know if it is water-based, but you know, it feels a bit thinner. It sort of holds, so I'm, I'm using it for now. It's, it's, it's okay, but it's not Loctite. So just watch out for that if you uh, buy stuff on eBay. I've also seen it actually written as this actual bottle advertised, which is fair enough. You know, you, you're paying less, you're getting a, a copy product, but to advertise it as a genuine product with a genuine label and then send you that. Yeah, that wasn't on. So anyway, they gave me my money back and uh, I've been using it and it's kind of okay. Right, let's get it in there and um, get these locked up. So we'll tighten it up first without the Loctite and just see if, if we can get this really tight without the needle moving. So that's taken up the slack now. So if I put some tension on, yeah, it's starting to move a little, just a little bit. So I think we'll, yeah, just, just a fraction there. All right, so we'll get that locked in. And then we've got to repeat that, I don't know, two, four, six, about 24 times, I think. So I'll get all these locked out and then bring it back and then just show you it all locked up and we'll move on to the next job. It's a bit awkward this one, but this is the last one to go in. Okay, just clean off the excess. I don't want Loctite going into the rail mechanism, that wouldn't do them any good. There we are, I think I've done them all. Okay, now we're going to make the little fill in piece that goes in here. It's 20 by 20, and the materials come in just a bit of regular aluminium. So it's 20 by 20, it's oversized, so we'll get that chopped down to the right length. Then we'll drill and tap two M5 holes here, and then we use the transfer punches just to get the, the ends marked, then we'll drill and tap those M8. So I'll get this cropped size, uh, I don't need to film that I don't think, and then uh, we'll bring you back once you've got the two holes tapped, and then we'll, we'll do the two end ones. Okay, so I've chopped it down to size and it's just a nice snug fit in there now. I've got it all lined up, clamped in place. Just some random bits of wood just to hold it. And then we're gonna use the transfer punch to transfer those two holes there for the M5 tapped and the two in the end for the M8. 
So the transfer punches, I think I showed these recently, they look like that. They've just got uh, little spikes on the end and they come in all the different sizes. So we'll drop the, let's do the end ones first just in case it uh, moves on us. Two there, and two in the end. So I've got everything drilled and tapped now. Okay, and these two end screws. Now we've aligned the table and the rails to the axis of the quill, we need to work our way back. So on the back of this table we've got this ball nut block and then the ball nut for the ball screw is bolted to that. Now it's quite loose at the moment, so we now know the ball nut is going up and down in line with the axis of the quill. So we'll use that to determine where we want the ball screw exactly to get that to go up and down so it's uh, parallel to the uh, quill as well. Right, so I think we'll take this cover off, uh, wind this all the way up and get this nipped up and then use the block to first get this in position and then the top bearing as well. Yeah, just about. Oh, to come out, get it out again, there we go. Um, I think they're M4s, so let's see. Yes, they are. Right. So that's quite loose. Yeah, that's in about the position it wants to be. So we'll just tighten that up. Okay, now these square nuts are uh, 19. And what, what we can do is use the hand wheel on the gears to give us something to tighten against. So I'm going to go that way. Okay. So that feels alright, and then we can do that little grub screw up. Keep it straight as I can because these like to chew when they're very small and then you can't get them out again. Okay, do another one. No, just the one. Okay, so we've got it nipped up there and on top of the ball nut itself. So always all the way down, almost to the bottom, and then we can do the lower bearing down here because that will have dictated the exact position it wants to be in. So we'll wind it down. I don't know which way to go. So I've just tightened this lower bearing but something didn't quite feel right. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so all pretty tight except just that back one there. I just can't quite get full torque on it but I think that's fine. Now I've noticed it's got slightly stiffer. Let's just make sure we haven't got anything binding. 
Unless the brake's loose. There's a lot more effort to... Yeah. Something doesn't feel right there. Uh, let's loosen them off again. Right, after about half an hour fiddling about and playing with all the different uh, settings on here, getting different things aligned to different bits, I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know what was going on. And then eventually I noticed on the brake piece here, you see it's all sort of to go all up there. Something's caught in the back and basically it was really stiff against that. You know, if I took the ball screw completely off, I couldn't actually move this by hand. So that's what the problem was. So I've taken the top piece off and cleaned whatever Whatever was going on at the back, back here, you can just see where it's just sort of catching there. Something rolled over and then got caught behind. So what we need to do now, I've just undone the screws for this, is just take the brake piece out. Yeah, as you can see, it's just scored all the way along there. So we'll clean that up, maybe just take a little bit more of the surface. Right back here. Oh no, that's okay. So it was just catching on the on the top plate here. Right, so what we'll do, actually while we're in this position, it gives us quite easy access to these bolts and uh, we'll just make sure it goes up and down freely and uh, without the braking at all and get it all nicely aligned and then we'll trim this to suit to make sure that works. And when I've done all that, I'll bring you back. Okay, long story short, um, I've spent many hours uh, fiddling around with this, just trying to get the ball screw lined up so it was nice and smooth. Um, I took quite a lot of footage, try and show you different things. In the end, I think I'm just going to explain where I've got to because just too much has happened. So I essentially took the ball screw out completely and the floating end at the bottom there, where it goes into the bearing, it's a 10 millimeter plane shaft, as I'm sure most of you know, that goes into a bearing. Now that had a little bit of run out on it and I wondered if that was causing some of the binding. So I took it over to the lathe, so stripped this all down, took the nut off, took it over to the lathe, machined that back down to six millimeters, and then I made up a, a collar that had a six millimeter interference fit and pressed that on and that gave me my 10 millimeter back on the outside, but I could remachine that to get it nice and concentric. Uh, that did help, but ultimately, um, I think because of this box section on the side and the way that the bearing is connected onto the side of that there, you can see in the end uh, there wasn't quite enough movement uh, or adjustment in these holes in here. So I've had to add these little washer about half a millimetre, just because the side of this box section looked completely flat and not true, just to get it perfectly in mind. And now I've done that and machined the end a lot truer and played around with it and got it nicely dialed in, it moves really, really nicely. So let me just show you that. Wind it up. Nice and free. And down again. Very little effort as you can tell there. Sorry, you might be able to hear banging. Uh, it's in the room above this garage. My daughter's on one of those computer games where you dance and you have to copy what they're dancing to on the screen and she's jumping up and down on the floor. So. As long as you didn't come through the ceiling, we're okay. Right, um, you'll also see, so I've opened this up, uh, remeshed these gears, got that just nicely in, uh, in mesh, and then add a little bit of grease on there. Got it all lined up here and everything dialed in, and it's really nice. So this is all ready to go back together. I've got to skim the, the brake front there so we don't have that catching again. Just take another quarter of a millimetre off, or maybe tenth of a millimetre. We'll have a look. Just make sure it's nice and clear, and then I'll get the brake working. Now, I was intending in this video to to then go on and you might just be able to see it at the back here. There's a DRO or the reed head and the main reed body. I was going to get that, all that dialed in and get the bracket sorted out. I think I've not allowed myself enough adjustment and enough float to get that dialed in and um, it's going to be a slightly bigger job than I first planned. So we'll look at that in the next episode. And so for now, let's summarize where we've got to.
Yeah, so we'll get that z-axis readout dialed in. So when we move this up and down, we can see it on the readout there for the vertical movement. So we'll get that done. Uh, then we need to turn our attention to the XY table that you might have seen a few videos ago. Um, I had a couple of options about how I was going to do that. If you remember, we had some bent lead screws, so I needed to look at some options there. Um, I had some parts on order. They've come through. So I'll bring up speed of where we got to with that, and uh, hopefully we'll machine some of those parts to get the XY table uh, working again. After that, there's still more jobs to do. I don't know if they'll be in the next video or not, but there's the, the assembly that comes off here and holds this to try and keep that in a, a nice uh, straight axis to keep that aligned because there's a tiny bit of free play in there because it's only held in by a little sort of uh, uh, cone-shaped uh, grub screw in there. runs in a groove, so see if we can get that a little bit better and hold the dimension. I've still got the some kind of guard or cover plate. I've got something drawn up, but uh, I'll probably make it in cardboard and just see what sort of style I want to go with. I just need something that can get this off, just in case you need to change from this ratio to the one below it there. There's sort of two speed options, as you can see back there. Most of the time we'll be running off the VFD. It's on the variable speed here, so it's just if we need the extra torque of the, uh, the lower ratio there, going on the low pulley to the medium one there. Um, you might have seen in a very early video as well that I wasn't too pleased with the run out on these. They're particularly badly made. Um, so I may be able to get those uh, centred in the in the lathe and then remachine these grooves to bring them on size or more likely have to machine them again. But we'll look at that in some future video. The other job in the future is once we've got that XY table working and moving smoothly, uh, or winding the handles there, we need to get the XY DRO set up. So I've got a pretty good idea about what I'm going to do there and how I'm going to make that work and assemble it, and then we'll get that hooked up to there. And I think that's probably about all the jobs. So there's a few more episodes to come yet. Hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're enjoying following along and um, discovering things as I discover them and solving the problems and moving on to the next job, next job, and just knocking them over one task at a time, and we'll get there in the end. So if you've enjoyed it, uh, feel free to leave a comment. If you've got any um Chuck suggestions, anything you've used that's uh, given good results, just let me know, that would be nice to know. Um, I might run with this, it's quite a cheap one, or maybe I'll invest in something in the future. Uh, thanks very much for watching, and see you next time.